Um, so let's start by just quick review of what these skills are. Um, they are brain-based skills. They're managed out of the frontal lobes of the brain. That's the part of the brain right behind the forehead. And the critical piece is, and we've only known this for a relatively short period of time, is that they take 25 years to reach full maturation. And that's in typically developing kids. If you've got a kid with an attention disorder or some other neurodevelopmental uh, disorder, it could take a good deal longer than that. Um, in fact, Barclay, Russ Barkley, who um, I consider the world's leading expert on ADHD, he talks about kids with ADHD lagging about 30% behind typically developing students. So you can do the math. You know, if you're working with a 12-year-old with ADHD, he's actually more like a nine-year-old. Um, and when, you, when it gets up to high school, that gap becomes even wider. Um, the estimates of the exact number of executive skills range from 1 to 40, at least as far as I've seen. Um, and that's from surveying research and the work of neuroscientists all the way up to practitioners and creators of checklists. So although we've come to at least recognize that there's a broad definition for executive skills that people can agree on, which is basically the, the skills that enable goal-directed behavior, um, how many skills there are, uh, varies from from person to person. Uh, when Dick and I created our scheme, we basically started with two questions. The first one was, of all the skills there are out there that people are talking about, which ones have the biggest impact on school performance? Uh, and we, we zeroed in on 11. Um, and then we said, can we come up with definitions that are so crystal clear that everybody gets them that we won't have? Because when you go to the neuropsych research, you can get bogged down in theory and uh, complex abstract concepts very quickly. We wanted to make our definitions accessible. Um, and I think we've come up with that. I'm just going to very quickly go through the 11 just so we all understand what skills we're talking about. Um, and the, the order in which I'll talk about them is the order in which we think they emerge developmentally. Um, so at some point as I'm talking about them, I'm going to say, okay, since this, this workshop is geared more towards elementary level, I'm going to say, okay, these are the skills you want to be focusing on at the elementary level because we really do think it's a progression. All right. So response inhibition, probably the first skill to emerge. Uh, uh, this is according to Barclay's model. Um, and actually, you can see the early signs of around six or seven months of age uh, in infants. Um, it's the ability to stop and think before you say or do something. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, just, just to give you a quick, I mean, when we're, we're focusing on teaching response inhibition, we figure if we can get stop and wait into kids, that's response inhibition. So we teach stop and wait. Um, working memory is the ability to hold information in mind while you're performing a complex task. Uh, Barclay maintains at seven or eight months of age that you see that emerge in an infant. Um, if I want to stress that out in a testing situation, I'll ask, I'll give kids an oral math problem and ask them to solve it in their head. It has multiple steps. You know, question off a standard IQ test. Eight birds are on the ground, four birds fly away, two other birds land. How many birds are on the ground now? You know, if a kid is, starts to solve that problem, they do, they do the first step and give me that as an answer, then I be, immediately say, hmm, wonder what's going on with working memory. Have they forgotten what the question is asking? Have they forgotten where they are in solving it? Um, kids with learning disabilities, this is usually the most challenging executive skill for them, uh, which is why they have trouble memorizing math facts or spelling words or even learning sight words. Um, Emotional control is the next one. First year of life is pretty important for this one. It's the ability to manage your emotions in order to complete tasks. Um, and and uh, again, I go, my background is learning disabilities, so I actually go back to thinking about kids with learning disabilities. If they have good emotional control, that can be a protective factor. Um, I see kids occasionally that I saw in elementary school and I then see them in high school. Usually the ones I'm seeing again in high school is because things are not going well and things are not going well because they have trouble managing their emotions. Emotions. And by the time they hit high school, people are looking at them as kids with behavior disorders, and it actually started out as a learning disability. Um, so this is a, a critical skill for learning. Uh, flexibility. Uh, this is the ability to go with the flow, to adjust to unexpected changes in plans or events or, or unexpected things. Um, this is not necessarily a problem, problematic skill for kids with ADD. Very often this is their strongest skill, right? They are go with the flow kinds of kids. Um, but I'm sure you can think about the kids who have trouble with flexibility, you know, kids on the autism spectrum. Um, there are others as well, but you know, kids on the autism spectrum, this one sort of jumps out at you. 
uh, sustained attention. Now this one is a critical feature of uh, kids with ADHD. Um, key phrase in our definition, the capacity to maintain attention to a situation or task. The key phrase is in spite of distractibility, fatigue, or boredom. Um, and I think Dick threw that part into the definition many years ago and I've been so grateful to him over the years because I don't know how many parents I've had in my office who say to me, and they've been nudged in by a teacher or by a pediatrician because someone thinks their kid has attention problems and they'll say, my kid can't have ADD. He can play video games for hours. Well, video games don't involve distractibility, fatigue, or boredom. So what I say is kids with ADHD, it's not that they have trouble paying attention, it's that, they, it's that they have trouble making themselves pay attention. That's the key feature there. Um, and then task initiation, the ability to begin projects without undue procrastination. Um, this one, although, although the, it may be a relatively early developing skill. Um, it's a little hard to tell when it develops because I think parents and teachers of young kids are just naturally adept at, at adjusting their expectations for kids with weak uh, task initiation. You know, so there's no parent of a preschool would realistically say to her child, could you pick up your bedroom sometime today? Because what preschool is going to initiate that task? Um, I do think this is a very late developing skill though. A, a mer not developing, maturing skill. In fact, this may be the last and hardest skill to acquire. Um, Okay, so I've very quickly gone through six skills. If you're at the elementary level, these are the six you should be focusing on. Um, and the examples I'm gonna give of how you do that in the classroom in various ways, probably, uh, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about this, but mostly focus on these first six skills. These are the foundational skills. From here on, all the other executive skills, A or later emerging skills, but B may have some of these earlier developing executive skills embedded in them. Uh, so planning is the next one. The ability to create a roadmap is a good metaphor for that, but there's a prioritization piece that's really critical there. If you can't prioritize, you're really gonna have trouble planning. Uh, and some, and it, it's helpful to sort out where is the, break, the breakdown when, when kids are having trouble planning, because sometimes we don't look specifically at prioritization and perhaps we should. Um, this one, I, when I think about school and planning, I think about long-term projects. Uh, and I've, for years, I've been thinking, when do kids develop that skill, the ability to plan a long-term project? I started with fifth grade, maybe a possibility. Kids probably have to be helped with it, probably have to be shepherded through the process. I, I'm even now pushing that date back. This is, that kind of planning is incredibly difficult for kids. Um, and so that's why, if we're talking about elementary school, I hope there's nobody in here who expects that by the time kids finish elementary school, they're going to be able to plan a long-term project by themselves. Um, if you found those kids, please talk to me because I want to know how they got there. Did you teach them? Because <laughs> I really think this is challenging. Um, organization, uh, the ability to create and maintain systems to keep track of information and materials. The key word in this definition is maintain. Um, you know, it, it, it's one thing to, to create an organizational system, but if you think of any disorganized kid you've ever worked with, um, it's the maintenance part that makes it hard. Um, and it's a long-term labor-intensive process to turn a disorganized kid into an organized kid. Um, so this is another one. I think this one actually, it, even though I said, uh, let, let's focus on the first six, if teachers as young as kindergarten or first grade can be building organizational strategies or just organization into their classroom, and I'll show you an example of a teacher, second grade teacher who I think does this really nicely. In a bit, I think that really helps things. Um, but in terms of explicitly teaching individual kids organizational strategies, I'd rather see it as a whole class approach. Um, Time management, we don't expect elementary kids to manage their own time. We do that for them. Both parents and teachers do it for them, and I think that's age appropriate. You do find that occasional kid who has this amazing sense of time, and unfortunately very often then they're worried about being late. Um, those aren't the kids I work with. Um, uh, my kids have no sense of what time is all about. Um, but again, we structure time for kids at the elementary level, and I think that's appropriate. Goal-directed persistence. In its full 
fully mature form, this is a very, very late developing skill. Because it's not just have it setting a goal, but it's got all these other executive skills embedded in it. You set a goal, but you can't forget it. You have to remember it, so there's working memory. You have to have a plan for achieving that goal, so there's planning. You have to start and finish the plan, so there's task initiation and sustained attention. Um, and you have to resist the temptation to do all those other fun things you'd rather be doing rather than working towards your long-term goal. And if that's irritating, so that, what's that? That's response inhibition. And if that's irritating or annoying for you, then you have to manage your emotions associated with it. Uh, this is a killer skill for middle school parents because they think their kids should have this skill by then and they don't. Again, you may find the occasional kid who does, but it's not common. Um, and my own son with ADD, it was late junior, early senior year in high school before I saw the first glimmers of this. So you can, if you can encourage persistence, that's the way to get to goal-directed persistence. So in, in, praising kids for effort, is saying, man, you worked hard on that. Or, boy, I saw how, how long you kept at that. That was great. That will encourage persistence. Um, and, and that's probably would be more age appropriate at the elementary level. And then finally, metacognition. Um, and this is the ability, first of all, to recognize you have, a, you have thoughts. Um, and that those thoughts can be used to achieve, uh, to understand, to problem solve, to achieve goals. Very late developing skill um, because it goes along with a brain process called pruning, which really doesn't kick into adolescence. Uh, so it is the rare kid below the fifth grade level who has any degree of metacognition, particularly around the kind of metacognition that we require kids to do for academic subjects. Um, and if I had one complaint about the Common Core, I would say that if you look at the Common Core standards, some, a lot of the second, third grade standards are asking kids to use metacognitive thinking and they don't have it then. And I'm sure you know that um, because then everybody stresses out with that. Okay. So now we can start talking about what the strategies are. Um, I'm going to give you different ideas, and let me just let me just go through it the way I've got it here. Uh, modifying the classroom environment to increase success. When kids are young, we don't expect them to have fully functioning executive skills, so we modify the classroom to support weak executive skills. Uh, and and there are three ways we modify it: we change the physical or social environment, we modify the tasks we expect kids to perform, or we change the way we had, in, as adults interact with kids um, to to support weak executive skills. Uh, it, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, our, our books go into a lot of detail on this, but just to give you a quick example of, of a couple of these, changing the physical or social environment. I don't know if any of you work at the preschool level, but if you talk to any good preschool teacher, they will tell you you never set up a preschool classroom with a broad open space in that classroom because that's a runway and preschoolers like to run. Um, and so you can spend all day reminding kids running is for outdoors and walking is for indoors, or you can set up the classroom sort of the way this room is set up, you know, with furniture everywhere, so they can't run very far before they run into a piece of furniture. Um, that's so that's a way to modify the physical environment. And again, think of the way your classroom is set up, and is it is it making it easier for kids with weak executive skills or harder, just based on how the classroom is set up. Same with the social environment, um, in terms of how 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 you place kids in the classroom, who they're sitting next to, how they're interacting with other kids, um, how we adjust, you know, for kids on the autism spectrum, for instance, we often make uh, adjustments to both the social and the physical environment to, to accommodate for the fact that these kids have huge problems with sensory overload. Um, and cafeterias, for instance, are incredibly overstimulating for kids on the spectrum, so we make adjustments for that. Or we make sure they have someone to eat lunch with, or we sign them a lunch buddy, so that's working on the, the social environment. Modifying the tasks we expect kids to perform um, again, that's another way we modify the environment. Um, here's one of the, the recommendations I make for, for people who work with kids on the spectrum. Um, I suggest that, and this applies just as when, when do you know you need an environmental modification for a kid on the spectrum? When they throw a tantrum or have a meltdown. You know, tantrums and meltdowns are a huge cute clue that tell you that the environment that kid is in is not a good fit for what that kid is capable of. And so, modify the environment and see if you can get him to the point where he's not throwing tantrums or having meltdowns. The other, the other behavioral cue for, for kids on the spectrum, but you may want to think about it with other kids as well, work avoidance. 
Um, I, I say especially with kids on the spectrum, and there are other kids out there who may be avoiding work because they're, they're just, it looks like way too effort, too much effort, and they just don't want to put in the time. You know, some kids with ADHD are like that. Kids on the spectrum, usually if they're avoiding work, they don't know how to do it. Uh, and if you're giving them an open-ended task, that's the explanation. These kids can't do open-ended tasks. So turn an open-ended task into a closed-ended task would be a way of modifying um, the, the task for, for a kid who, who, who struggles there. With kids with ADHD, a task modification would be building in frequent breaks. If you're giving them something that takes 30 minutes to do and their attention span is five, well, I build in it breaks every five minutes because they are going to take breaks every five minutes. And at least if you can structure it, then you can start talking to them about how, you know what, we've been taking breaks every five minutes. Can we move to six now? <laughs> can we move to seven? So you gradually try to stretch that out. Um, changing the way the adu adults interact with kids. Um, I mean, there. <laughs> the one of the ones I think about is using positive reinforcement more often than we typically use with kids. Um, if, if you can, and the, the research shows if you can achieve a ratio of three positives for every corrective piece of feedback you give to a kid, that is a very powerful way to change behavior and it's very effective. It's hard to do. Uh, in fact, my colleague Dick at one point was, he was tracking uh, ratios of positive to corrective feedback in, in a bunch of preschools in New Hampshire. Um, and preschool teachers are the most positive teachers I've ever seen. They, they don't have the set curriculum that they feel compelled to get kids through, so they, they're more relaxed. But what he, the typical ratio he found, three correctives to one positive. The best he came up with was one to one. And I'm sure that worked fine, but again, for kids who are struggling, if you can achieve that three to one ratio, that can make a difference. Okay, so again, that's just a, a quick set of examples for how you might modify the environment for kids with weak executive skills. Here's another way to think about uh, helping kids um, with weak executive skills uh, in school, and that is, um, Introducing executive skills terminology through classroom lessons and through, vi through visuals. This is where I've seen the most exciting work done in the last few years. And I just want to share one school with you, and I'll come back to it in a couple of different ways, because these do it nicely. And we've used this school uh, as a model for helping schools in New Hampshire think about how to do this as well. Um, this, is a, this is a picture of a school called the Montcrest School in Toronto, Canada. It's a K through eight school. Um, and uh, several years ago, they contacted us uh, asking if we would come in and do a teacher, <coughs> staff, and parent um, workshop on, on executive skills. But at that point, they'd already done a whole lot. I think one, a couple of their teachers had went to one of George McCluskey's workshops and came back and said, oh my god, this is what's missing from our school. It's a private school, but 30% of the kids in that school, they're committed to this, 30% of the kids in that school have significant learning and attention problems. So they've got a high special ed population. Um, and so they realized what was missing from their curriculum was, was support for, and help for kids with weak executive skills. So the first thing they did was they, and again, this is something you may want to think about. They organized a study group. Those two teachers said, hey, we're going to spend a year thinking about executive skills. Anybody want to join our study group? And they had like seven teachers sign up. Uh, and they read everything they could get their hands on. Uh, they, I think they got to our books at one point. We've had our books used as, as book clubs in schools, you know, all over the place. And that's a good way to start, start with that. So at the end of the year, they went to the administration and they said, this is it. Can we present these concepts to the rest of the faculty here? Because we think um, it, it, this could revolutionize our school. So they did. Um, they did the training of the faculty. The faculty as a whole agreed to focus on executive skills. When they first started out, they identified it seven they wanted to focus on. Um, at last count, I think they're up to 10. In fact, here they are. The vehicle that they came up with for teaching executive skills was they created a superhero for each skill. You know, very similar to what Mich Michelle Garcia Winter does. I mean, she has a superflex character, which would be probably comparable to Flexi Lexi here. Um, where, so, it, at in each of the classes, teachers would introduce these various superheroes um, and, and then talk about um, so what do, one of my favorites, Stopatron, response inhibition. You know, so what do you think Stop, Stopatron is good at? You know, Stopatron is, is good at recognizing that he's yelling out rather than raising his hand. Stopatron is really good about when he's out at recess and someone says something that bugs him, he can stop himself before he hits him, you know, that kind of thing. So the, these, um, these materials are for sale if you go to their website. Uh, did I include that? Oh, shoot. Um, 
EFs to the rescue.ca and two is the number two EFs to the rescue.ca. Uh, you, you can purchase these, they come as posters um, and little sort of cue cards. Uh, there's a script on the back for introducing each character and there's a set of strategies because they are, re and I'll show this later, they're really big on, so you got a problem with response inhibition, what are you going to do about it? Okay, so here are some strategies you can use, um, but I'll come back to that. I, uh, this past summer, I taught a uh, summer class at the University of Southern Maine. They gave me five days to teach a class on executive skills, which was wonderful. I felt like, I mean, you can hear I'm racing now. I felt like, at the end of it, I thought, oh, that's how much time I really needed. Um, so I had 17 students in the class. It was a mix of regular ed special ed teachers. I had a couple of school counselors. I had a school administrator, a special ed administrator, um, speech pad, a couple of speech pads. It was a really nice group. And on the last day, what I said to them, okay, we spent four days talking about executive skills. You do a project that consolidates what you've learned about that. And I had the second grade teacher who put together the best materials, and I'm going to share them with you. Um, and I was so surprised. She was probably one of the oldest people in the group, so she totally destroyed my stereotype that once you reach, you know, age 45, you can't do anything new. Um, she just took these concepts and ran with it. So what she did was, she actually bought, I think in the PowerPoint I made available, I did not include the pictures because these are copyrighted and I can't do that. I mean, I've gotten permission from the people who created these. So I've given you her PowerPoint without the pictures in them. If you buy the materials, you could import them. But for each one, she created a poster uh, that, that introduces the character but also gets kids thinking. You know, so she has a, a sort of catchphrase um, to, to really sort of capture the, the crux of each executive skill. So for Stopatron, it's stop and think. She really thought hard about what would that, how would a second grader understand response inhibition? She has them use the technical terms. We've had really good luck with that, using these technical terms with kids is that young. Um, but this question, I mean, she wanted to come up with questions that kids could identify. Does your body ever move too fast for your brain? You know, kids, second graders understand that. And so then she's got the strategies built here. Stop what you're doing, freeze like a statue, take a few deep breaths, think about what to do next, get, get help if needed. Um, I won't go through all of them, but I'll go through a few more anyway. This Emotabot is the emotional control uh, character. Calm body and voice is her. And you can see it's not only captures the executive skill, but it also is the positive coping strategy. Calm body and voice. Do your feelings ever take over your thinking? I love that way. Um, stop, breathe, use positive self-talk. I can handle this. Uh, ask for a break, break. Big problem, little problem. She talks about helping kids discriminate. Is this a big problem? Is this a little problem? Uh, and then the label is emotional control. Uh, Sustaino the Great <laughs> is the sustained attention character. Uh, and the, again, the, the phrase at the top, look and listen. Is it ever hard to stay focused and pay attention? And then she, again, gives some strategies. Um, Flexi Lexi, go with the flow. Does it bother you when there's a change of plans? Obviously, for some kids, no, it doesn't bother them at all. But the kids for whom that is an issue, they understand that. Um, uh, Remy is remember me. Uh, remember more, one, two, three, four. Do you sometimes forget things you want to remember? Practice building your memory with games like concentration and memory. Use cues from around the room. She encourages kids, if they're stuck and they can't remember something, she says, is there anything in this room that will remind you? Can you look at what the kid next to you is doing? Does that remind you of what you're supposed to be doing right now? Um, check your hiding places <laughs> if they're losing things. Uh, desk, folders, backpacks for things you need. Uh, get up and go. This is task initiation. Uh, do you ever have trouble starting? getting started on a task, turn and talk. Tell your partner what you're going to do first. So again, sometimes kids have trouble with task initiation. They don't know where to start. And uh, it, it, turning and talking is like priming the pump. Okay, just you know, just uh, let your mind go and see what comes up. Um, and so she's got a strategy for that. Uh, organization, know where it goes. This is Plan Man. Um, the Montcrest people combine planning and organization, which I think is fine, although I mean, personally, I'm great at planning, I'm lousy at organization, so I do see those as two separate things. Uh, is your stuff a disorganized disaster? Um, 
uh, a wear bear is metacognition. Uh, and where, there she's encouraging kids to think about it. Think aloud about what you were doing. Ask yourself, how did that go for me? How did I do? So that's getting kids to self-evaluate. Uh, write about your learning, uh, your thinking, or what you learned. Um, so that's an example of how you might incorporate executive skills into the classroom. Once you give kids the vocabulary, then they start applying it independently. In fact, let me just give you a quick example of that. Um, I did a, a I was invited by a school in LA several years ago to come out and spend the day with the school talking about executive skills. And they had me spend the, the first hour in the day doing a keynote for teachers about executive skills. And then I spent the day with teachers by grade level talking about, okay, what could you do with executive skills at the first grade level, the second grade level? It was a K through eight school, I think. Um, at the end of the day, those teachers said to me, you need to come back and talk to our parents. They really need to hear this too. Um, so I came back the next year, did a one hour keynote for parents, uh, and then spent the day with with, with the teachers again by grade level saying, so what have you done since the last time I was here? And I had great tours of classrooms showing strategies posted on the wall or checklists or you know, here's the daily routine kind of thing. So the classes really had done a lot to support um, executive functioning. But my favorite example was told by a second grade teacher. Uh, and the story she told was she had had some fun, fun event planned for the class and it had been planned for weeks. The kids were all excited about it. She was building up their enthusiasm and everybody was, you know, sort of on tenderhooks about this fun thing they were going to do. Well, the day of the event, it fell through. So she had to get up in front of the class first thing in the morning and say, remember that fun thing we were going to do today? We can't do it. Uh, so she delivers the bad news, and this little second grade girl sighs, and she says, I guess we'll have to be flexible. <laughs> that told me, I mean, isn't that what you want from learning, that you can learn a concept in one context and apply it independently in another context and it's accurate? I mean, it's a very small step to go from there to what's the coping strategy for disappointment, which would be a great discussion to have next after that girl says that. So what can we do with the fact that we're all disappointed about this? Let's think of some things we could say to ourselves. You know, let's think about how we handle it. Um, another way to build executive skills into the classroom is to look at the classroom routines either you already have in place or that you want to put in place and identify an executive skill component or components to those routines and as you teach the routine also teach the executive skills. Uh, so this is a, one example is a beginning of the day routine. I've had a lot of schools and teachers do this. Um, I'm just going to give you one example. Um, you know, which would start with a whole class discussion about what do we need to get started first thing in the morning. You know, what are the things, and you know, this is typical of elementary schools. You have to hang up your coat, you have to get a, do something with your backpack, if you have to get out your homework, you take attendance, you do lunch money. I mean, there's a bunch of sort of busy work that has to be done. Um, but if you turn it into a smooth flowing routine and talk to kids about, here's why this routine is important, because it makes us work way more efficiently, so we can get a lot more done. And the, why does it work more efficiently? Because we're getting better at task initiation. Um, we're getting better at working memory because we're holding on to that routine and we don't have to sort of refresh our memories every day. Um, and so you can talk about what executive skill that's supporting. Uh, then you can make a list, okay, what do we have to do to get ready first thing in the morning? Kids throw stuff out, uh, figure out um, what a logical order for task completion is and then turn it into a list. This is one that was posted on, on the, the teacher posted on the wall. You know, number one, go to seat. Number two, unpack your backpack. Number three, take out folders um, or, and notes and put in bins. Put lunchbox and lunchbox carrier. Hang up backpack and other items. Flip over card, which I think was her attendance uh, strategy. Go to seat and wait for announcements. Start morning work. Um, I, th that school I, was one I'd worked with and I, I visited a number of classrooms that put in place a morning routine. Uh, I was in a first grade classroom, I think, where the teacher did, she took that same kind of routine, but rather than posting it on the wall, she created an individual card that she taped to every kid's desk. She printed it out on colorful paper, she laminated it, taped it to the desk. And so when kids got in first thing in the morning, she'd say, okay, start going through your routine. And they'd go through it step by step, and as they finished each one, they would either check it off or cross it out with a dry erase marker. It's laminated, so when the routine is all done, you can then erase it and it's ready for the next day. 
Um, so again, you prompt kids to go through the routine, and after a while, they just do that naturally. Uh, you know, I have, uh, when it's up and running, you praise kids for using it. You can periodically review with them. So why are we doing this anyway? Remind me. Um, and then, you know, if you, if you want to build in any kind of reinforcer, you can count the number of students who fail to finish all the steps in a lot of time, create a graph, try to make that graph go down. You can set a goal, build in a reward. <laughs> those, those classrooms I visited, they didn't have to do that. Kids just got into the automatic routine of doing everything that they needed to get ready for the day. Um, this is that same second grade teacher. Um, and these were some of her examples. I asked her to, to uh, present. I, was, I did something, again, at University of Southern Maine. They had an alumni uh, conference. And, and uh, I asked her to talk about what she was doing in the classroom. And so this, this came from her PowerPoint as well. Um, Patty LaRosa was his name. I feel like I should give her credit for this. Uh, so this is, this is just the, where she lists. And again, you guys probably already do this. Just think about how it connects to executive skills. Uh, where she lists each day's specials. It's different every day. And she's got a today, which reminds kids so they can immediately check when they come in. So what's our special for today? Today is music. Um, this is her morning routine. When you come in, take your folder out of your backpack, pass in your homework, pass in notes from home and lunch money, put your folder in the folder box, check in on the lunch count, take care of coats, hats, boots, and backpacks. So that was her morning routine. Um, posting a daily schedule helps all students build a mental picture of their day. Young students are also developing a sense of how long things take. So you get everything in the morning routine and you write down the time it starts. Uh, when a schedule change just does occur, changing the card helps less flexible students adjust their thinking. Uh, my colleague Dick to help kids who have trouble dealing with unexpected changes in plans. And again, these are kids on the spectrum who particularly struggle with this. He was working in some classrooms where they had those kids. Um, and he introduced, um, as a way to help kids adjust to plans, um, he, his classes too also had the morning schedule. I think they were set out as pictures. So it was a picture schedule. But he introduced a lightning bolt. And as one of those pictures, the lightning bolt meant, oops, change. <laughs> uh, so when, when the schedule changed, the teacher would place the lightning bolt on the schedule to signal, signal this, is where, this is a change we're going to have adjust to. When he introduced the, the lightning bolt, he got the teachers to introduce it by uh, introducing it with a fun activity. So the first time she used the lightning bolt, she said, oh, look at lightning bolt means uh, unexpected change. Guess what? The lightning bolt means we're going to have ice cream at 2 o'clock. <laughs> so the first time kids adjust to a change in plans, they're adjusting to something fun. Uh, and then you can gradually spread that out, and, and that lightning bolt could mean something unpleasant. It's just that a change comes up. Um, a daily jobs menu keeps all students on track with what needs to be done. Tasks can be numbered or starred to prioritize them when they start to pile up. The use of different colors allows the teacher to direct the student's attention to a specific task, which, again, when you're in the classroom, you think about these things. So rather than just using all black, you can say, OK, we're using the blue one now. We're, doing, we're on the turquoise one now. Um, <coughs> Organization is key. Limit what students can keep in their desk. Teach them a way to organize their desks and have them check it daily. Provide a storage system so there are no loose papers floating around. Uh, so the paper in this desk, the papers are on the left-hand side, the books are on the right-hand side. Um, my colleague Dick's wife, Megan, was a K-1 teacher for many years. And uh, she was probably about as ADD as they come. But she recognized the value of some of these things. At the end of every day, she would say to her class, OK, we're going to do a speed clean. And then she'd set the kitchen time for five minutes. Let's see how fast we can get things cleaned up. And it became a game. Um, you were also getting things organized and getting things cleaned up. Um, OK. Next, design class-wide interventions to target specific executive skill challenges. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Both of, both of these, um, actually the Maharamut one, really took off from the Montcrest School. Uh, this was a, a school that Dick was working with in, in, uh, outside of Durham, New Hampshire. Um, and he met with second grade teachers because they wanted to try something around introducing executive skills to their classroom. They focused on just two. Uh, and what we found over and over again, these are the two that first and second grade teachers focus on more than any other. Response inhibition and sustained attention. Um, so teaching kids to wait and 
teaching kids to stick with stuff long enough to get it done seems to be critical skills at that grade level. Um, and so they too came up with superheroes. They came up with their own, which I strongly encourage you to do that because when a school does that, then they get invested in thinking, what kind of a superhero do we want? I mean, you can purchase the stuff from Macro School, but this almost makes it more interesting. Uh, so they came up with, instead of Stopatron, which is the robot that Moncrest used, they came up with a dinosaur they called Stoposaurus. Uh, and for sustaining attention, they called it F Focus Phantom. Um, and then they came up with, so these were the behaviors that they were particularly trying to focus on. Uh, for response inhibition, again, wait. Uh, raise hand before talking, wait to be called on, hands to yourself, body to yourself, maintain location, use just the right voice. And they were particularly focusing on uh, meeting time, read aloud, independent work time is when they were focusing on that. Uh, with sustained attention, there they're sort of, they're, their cue is look and listen. Um, and there what they're looking at is the student oriented to the speaker or the activity. Are they asking, are the questions and comments they're making on topic? Uh, or are they passively engaged? Are they keeping their body still and calm? Is there task completion? Uh, and are they staying in their seat? Um, I, as I read those, I'm realizing there's some overlap between response inhibition and sustained attention, which you will also find as you start working with these terms is that one sort of bleeds into the other. Um, it's helpful to maintain separate categories just because it, it helps you to think about what are we focusing on here but sometimes they overlap. Uh, so they basically came up with these two superheroes and they described what they were good at. So Stoposaurus waits his turn. Stoposaurus listens to and follows all directions, listens to the person talking, uh, thinks of others' feelings, is respectful, raises hand and, and uh, respects personal space. Uh, focus phantom um, never gives up ignores distractions, works the whole time, listens quietly, uh, acts appropriate, asks appropriate questions, double checks work, turns eyes and body to the speaker. So those are the behaviors they were trying to encourage through Stoposaurus and Focus Phantom. So during circle time they would introduce these characters and they would talk about how helpful they are and they might even prompt them to, you know, out at recess you might find that Stoposaurus, if he's there with you he may help you out. You know, second graders are still have that imagination and they can take these characters and, and, and and anthropomorphize them. In fact, um, you know, within a couple of weeks of introducing these characters, the teachers were saying, kids were coming in from recess saying, boy, Stoposaurus really helped me out there. Um, or even coming in from school and saying, my brother was really trying to bug me last night, but boy, Stoposaurus was right there for me. So they, they were applying these strategies and, and they, through the vehicle of these superheroes. Um, so that's an example of how, um, how you can incorporate any, again, just focusing on one or two to start with might be a place to go rather than introducing all 11 um, or even all six you know, at the elementary level. Um, let me talk now about uh, a different approach used by, um, this was an intervention that was designed by uh, a school psychologist and she was working with three second grade teachers again. Um, they all wanted to work on one particular behavior uh, and the behavior that they chose um, was calling out during whole group instruction. So the behavior was calling out the time and place whole group instruction because all three of these teachers realized this was a problem for their class. Um, and so uh, what this school psychologist did was um, she sort of created a structure and, and a sequence for, for how this intervention was designed and then the teachers carried it out. Uh, and she had, she built in some key pieces to all of this. Um, student input, so she would ask kids, this is a problem, what do you notice? Um, both about uh, what happens when kids call out during class, so you're getting a sense of they recognize this is a problem. And then talking about, so if this is a problem that we want to tackle as a class, what are some things we could do to tackle it? Um, she also, they had clear target behavior, so the behavior was very well defined. All the kids understood what they were focusing on. They practiced it with feedback, so they had practice sessions. Okay, today we're going to practice not calling out. Um, they assigned leadership roles for kids, and it was a rotating role. It, so if you had a, a, a group of kids at your desk, one kid at each desk would be the coach for the day. So they might prompt kids um, by reminding them that not to call out. And obviously, if the goal is to not call out, um, you want a nonverbal way to remind them, right? Because otherwise you're just calling out. So 
that's what they developed, picture cues for reminders. Um, and again, there were several options which they downloaded off the internet and, and it, it, either kids choose, chose their own or the teachers did, so all of these. So all they had to do, like say that was um, on that, if the kids were working at a table, you had one of these cues on the desk, the coach that day could just point to the cue to remind kids, remember, we're working on this. Um, now here was what was particularly interesting, yeah, let, me, let me just explain before I show you the results. Three teachers, all focusing on calling out, um, they used three different approaches. And the school psychologist took a baseline before this intervention was designed and then she went back at the end of the year or after several months, I forget what the timeline was, um, to then count call outs again to see if there was any improvement in any of the groups. So here were the three strategies. Um, in, in teacher, let me see which one it was. One teacher posted those cues, those visual cues on the wall. So there was one poster on the wall that kids would refer to. Uh, another teacher um, had a cue actually on each kid's desk. So they weren't arranged in tables, but they, each kid has one of those cues on their desk. So as they were just sitting at their desk, that cue would sort of prompt them to remember not to call out. Um, the, third, the third teacher was more informal about it. He handed out the cues to kids, um, but the kids then put them in their desk out of sight. So, and he also informally, he was just not as, as uh, I mean, I, I, he was a great teacher from what I understand, but that wasn't his style to be particularly structured about it. So he would just remind kids, remember, we're practicing not calling out, but didn't make a big deal of it. So you can imagine, <laughs> uh, you may be able to anticipate the results. Um, so here's the baseline. This first teacher, um, this was the one who had the individual cues on each kid's desk. During baseline, had the whole class 25 call-outs for two 15-minute sessions. So that's about, the average is about one call-out per minute for the whole class. Um, in December, she came back in May, 10 call-outs for two minutes, two, for two, oh no, I'm sorry, this is the one with the poster on the wall. Uh, 10 call-outs for two 15-minute sessions, um, so that's one every three minutes. So she dramatically improved it. The kids are still calling out once every three minutes. The second one was the teacher who had the individual cue cards and individual tasks. Um, so in the beginning, 10 call outs for two 15 minute sessions, which is one every three minutes. Um, but in May, three call outs for two 15 minute se sessions. That's one call out for every 10 minutes. So that was some of the best results they got with the individual cue cards on the desk. And finally, that last teacher, um, the, the more relaxed and formal one, in the beginning, 16 call outs for two 15 minute sessions. So that's about one call out for every two minutes. Um, in May, 25 call outs for two 15 minute sessions. That's one call out per minute. So they actually regress. They got twice as bad at calling out. <laughs> Which makes me think that if you're going to design an intervention to address this, it probably helps to be pretty on top of it uh, and to be pretty structured about how you do it rather than just assuming that, okay, we're going to do something about it. Um, but it just didn't, it didn't go as well. Um, okay. This, another approach. When teaching lessons in all subject areas, label the executive skills that students need to use to master the skill. So I've already talked about how if you're setting up a daily routine, um, like getting ready for school in the morning, you can talk about which executive skills you need. This is, um, these are a couple of sort of snapshots of a lesson plan developed by a teacher. This was a teacher named Lori Faith. She was at the Montcrest School. She's actually working on her doctorate right now uh, in the area of executive skills. So she's left uh, teaching. Um, but before she left, she was a master at being able to look at any particular task or lesson that she was teaching to kids and identify what executive skill components there were to that. And then, um, incorporating that into her instruction. So I'll just give you two examples. This is, this is a kindergarten example, cutting with scissors. What executive skills do you need for cutting with scissors? You need response inhibition and you need planning. 
Right, planning to, before you start cutting, just sort of look at what's that shape you're trying to cut out. And response inhibition, because you want to work slowly and carefully. If you rush too fast, which kids with impulse control problems do, you're less likely to cut accurately. Um, so that's that's what she, what she does. And in fact, she talks about criteria for success. And so she's not just looking, uh, I mean, she's looking at the final product, but she's saying, you know, how are we going to do this? What are executive functions are we going to use to do a good job? Okay, I'll watch to see who does planning and inhibition. <laughs> Those are our criteria for success. So she builds in criteria for success that she's looking for evidence of the child um, either using that executive skill or having a strategy for coping with an obstacle associated with that executive skill. This is a long division. And the other thing that's on here is the traditional teaching paradigm contrasted with an EF teaching paradigm. So the traditional teaching paradigm, you would be instructing kids, there are four steps to long division. You know, divide, multiply, subtract, bring down. Uh, repeat these steps carefully and neatly. Don't forget to double check as you go. Uh, when you incorporate executive skills, she says there are four steps. Divide, multiply, subtract, bring down. Which executive functions am I using? So you may, if you can get kids to answer, that's great. If not, you feed it to them. Yeah, working memory and organization. I'm going to see if you can use these. You know, organization, obviously, you've got to line those numbers up so you're subtracting the right numbers. So there's the organization piece. Working memory, do you remember where you are in the four-step process of doing division? Do you remember to check your work? Um, so those are just two examples. Um, when you get really good at being able to look at anything you're doing with kids and seeing the executive skill component, this becomes a whole lot easier. It's funny, she wrote it, we're revising our executive skills in children and adolescent book. Lori wrote a chapter for us, pretty much describing this process. And all through the chapter, she, she's saying, this is easy. <laughs> and Dick was the editor for that chapter, and he kept, he wrote her back and said, Lori, this is not easy. <laughs> You've just been doing this for a long time, so you think it's easy. So pull out all those statements about how easy it is because you're going to discourage everybody because they're going to think, what's wrong with me? This is not easy. So we got her to, to tone that down because it really does, it does take time. Um, okay. Yeah, I did have some other things I want to talk about. Um, Help students, so help students identify what executive skills are required to perform tasks and, and manage behaviors. So you can incorporate this, in, again, into your daily conversations with kids. And these are just a, several examples of how you might elicit this information from kids. What executive skill will you need to get through recess without getting in a fight? It could be response inhibition, could be emotional control. Um, for tonight's homework, what executive skills will help you get it done? Uh, and getting them think about task initiation, sustained attention, time management maybe if they're, if they're ready to start thinking about that. Uh, we're about to do 20 minutes of sustained silent reading. What executive skills will you need to get through this successfully? And again, it would be sustained attention and, um, <clears throat> and, and task initiation at a minimum. Um, but you may also want to talk about other executive skills that might be in there. And it may vary from kid to kid. Um, in fact, tomorrow uh, in my session, I'll talk about a, an individual student-centered approach to designing interventions for individual kids, which will get at that. <clears throat> Have students generate and use strategies for overcoming obstacles to ex effective executive skill use. So it's not just, it's not enough to say, so this is the executive skill you need. Um, but if you find that kids are struggling with that, to say, okay, this requires working memory. And I, I could see by the way you did yesterday's math that that was hard for you, so let's come up with a strategy for this. Uh, and this is something that the Moncrest School, they really focused on this, and I'm just going to show you how they did it. Um, Almost every, every, especially at the lower elementary, I, I don't remember seeing it as much at, at the um, uh, grades six through eight, um, but at the lower elementary, almost every classroom had, had a strategy chart on it. Um, and this one has 10 different strategies. Um, so as issues come up in the class, the teacher could say, looks like you're having a hard time paying attention. Can you find a strategy there that might be, you might be able to use? Um, you know, for instance, a stone means, <laughs> they don't talk talk about fidget toys, they talk about focus objects because they want to make it more positive. So is there a focus object that you could sort of hold in your hand that would give you something to do while you're listening to the class? Um, 
ask for a break might be a problem with, if that's a problem with sustained attention. You could ask for a break. I mean, it looks like you're really having a hard time sticking with that task now. Ask for a break. The, the five up and five down strategy, uh, Dick and I spent a couple of days at that school. We spent the first day just observing the classrooms and the second day talking with kids to find out what their perception was of how it was all working. But I saw the five up, five down strategy in place. It was in a, this class, it was divided into larger classes um, and then smaller classes for the kids who needed more, um, more personalized instruction, the kids with learning disabilities or attention problems. So it was one of the smaller classes. I think there were maybe six kids in the class. It was like a third grade class. Um, and they were talking about something they'd read the day before. The teacher was asking questions and they were going through this discussion and kids were getting answers. And so the teacher sort of stops everything and said, okay, everybody, five up and five down. <laughs> and what that meant was you can get up and move around for five minutes, five fine things to do, and then sit down. You know, it could be go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, get a snack, um, talk to your friend. I mean, she wasn't counting the number of five, but that was to sort of just five, five, find five different things to do, and then we'll get back to work. And then, that, then she could regroup quickly. So it was just a shorthand way of let's take a break, here's something to do during your break, now let's get back to work. This is another one, another classroom. Um, uh, again, different strategies. The five up, five down appears again. As some of these uh, look more like their strategies for emotional control, which is, as I think about the strategies they were posting, there were a lot of sustained attention, a lot of emotional control strategies. So breath meditation, that would be an emotional control strategy. Just stop for a minute and just follow your breath. If you're familiar with mindfulness meditation, um, that, that would be increasing. Heartbeat awareness might also be a way, okay, so stop. Can you feel your heart beating? Can you get it to slow down? Um, some of these I don't know exactly what, but you can again see that they have listed the executive skills on, on the right-hand side. You know, this school, I mean, you couldn't walk 10 feet in the school without seeing some poster reminding kids about executive skills, so it really was, it permeated the entire school. Uh, this was another poster on another wall that just had other strategies to it. Um, using a one to five scale, for instance, is if you, I'm sure you're familiar with that in terms of helping kids identify where are they in terms of managing their emotions. Are they you know, about to explode or are they handling it fine? Or I think it goes the other way around. Um, slant as a strategy, which I forget what it stands for, but you may be familiar with that. It's a, an attention a strategy. Um, stop probably refers to, it could be just stop or it could be stop and think. Um, um, the other thing this school did was um, when they introduced executive skills into their curriculum, about halfway through the year they decided to uh, make it a component of their report card. That was actually when they invited us in. Dick was actually the one to do the presentation because they wanted parents to understand what the report card was all about. Um, and so what they did was uh, they took each of the 11 executive skills and broke it down into component parts. Um, and then they had, with the younger kids, the teachers assessed where were they in terms of their, their um, acquisition of that particular behavior or skill. Uh, and they used, they spent a lot of time thinking about how are we going to grade kids. Because uh, they started out thinking, okay, meets grade level expectations, below expectations, above expectations. They weren't happy with that because it sounded critical uh, and they weren't sure. With the older kids, grades five through eight, they had kids self-assessing. And how would a kid be able to know whether they were at grade level or meeting expectations or not? So they, they, focused, they ended up with three levels, which I really like. Um, coaching, reminders, and independent. So at the very, if kids were really at the early stages of learning the skill, that means they need coaching and assistance to learn and use strategies. Um, if they had the strategies now and they were getting better, but they, need, they didn't always use them, so they needed occasional reminders, then the, the reminder phase, and then uh, they were at the independent phase. Um, and so as kids were, <coughs> either the kid or the teacher was assessing how they were on those skills, if they were struggling in any area, they then had these um, strategy sheets, which they would share with the kid and say, okay, so sustained attention is a problem for you. Can you see any strategy that you want to focus on to try to work on this problem? Uh, and the kid would highlight it or, or write it in by hand. 
Here's a different approach to um, working on executive skills. This was actually something I did with a school called the Brookstone School in Georgia. And it was, uh, it was a K through 12 school. Uh, this particular strategy I did with 6 through 12, so grade 6 through 12. Um, they asked me, it was really interesting, they asked me to come in and spend the day at their school. Usually when I'm asked to do that, they want me to spend time with teachers and parents. They wanted me to spend time with kids, which was great fun. But I, I had to stop and think about what kids is this developmentally appropriate for? I'm this complete stranger walking into a school. You know, can I really talk with second graders about strategies for executive skills? So I limited it to grade seven through six through 12. But I do think you could use this approach, especially if you know your kids, um, with kids younger than that. Because I've done similar things with kids at least as young as, as third and fourth grade. Um, but I'll at least show you what I did and you can figure out, could I adapt this for my class? Um, so the kids they wanted me to talk to were kids in their learning center. So not the pop school population at large, but the kids who were struggling. Usually with either attention disorders or um, uh, learning disabilities. Relatively mild, they weren't severe learning disabilities. It was a private school. Um, Oh, okay, so, so what I did um, was I asked them to collect some information for me first. Uh, we've got a couple of executive skill questionnaires that we ask kids to fill out. I wouldn't ask kids as young as elementary school because um, I mean, it's, it's even hard to get high school students to, to respond to those questionnaires accurately. But I did and it worked out pretty well. So we felt that we have an executive skills questionnaire that, which I asked them to have all the kids I was going to be meeting with fill out. And then I asked the Learning Center staff to um, tabulate and tell me which are the, the five weakest skills that these kids are reporting on average. What are the five weakest skills? Uh, no, the three weakest skills I asked them. And then I also have something called an executive skills problem checklist, um, which uh, the one I use is a secondary level. We've created an elementary version. We, again, we don't have kids fill out the elementary version. We have parents or teachers fill it out. So this piece, I'm not sure you would be able to copy, but I, this is what I did. So this is where the information, this is where I started. So that has, I take each of our 11 executive skills and I broke it down again, almost like the Montclair School did. The sustained attention, here are six descriptors of that. Response inhibition, here are six descriptors of that. And what I asked kids to do was to check off how many of those was a, were a problem for them that they felt got in the way of effective studying, because we were mostly focusing on studying. Um, and then I asked them, this is the way I use it in my clinical practice as well, I asked them, usually kids with attention problems will check off out of 60, they may check off 20. If I ask their parents to fill it out, the parents will check off 40. <laughs> so kids still aren't, don't have the same perception as their parents do, but at least I'm getting 20 where they say, yeah, it's an issue. But 20, you can't do anything with 20. So then I say, go back, those, look at those ones you checked off as a problem, pick the top three, pick the three that you think get in the way the most. Um, and so that's what I asked them to do with the kids in the, uh, at Brookstone, was to then go through and give me the top five problems, the ones that got the five bit highest votes. And so when I spent the day with those kids, I started out, I had like 45 minutes with each class, and I, I started out by saying, okay, you guys, remember you filled out this executive skills questionnaire, you filled out this problem checklist, here were the results, because the teacher hadn't shared them yet. These are the three weakest executive skills you guys are reporting. Here are the five biggest challenges that you think get in the way of studying. Uh, and then we focused on the challenges. We said, okay, I got five here. We don't have time to talk about all five of them. Let's pick one or two and brainstorm some ideas. Um, and so I'd have them vote. Okay, number who, who votes for number one? Who votes for number two? And so we, we selected like the top two or three, however many I could get through in 45 minutes. And then I would say, so what do you do for that? Somebody have an idea for this one? And I was typing their responses on my laptop. But when it was done, the teacher said to me, what can we do with all these results? And I said, I'll send you all this stuff on my laptop. What I suggest you do, thinking again, a mock school, turn them into posters, put them on the wall, leave space at the bottom for kids to add other strategies to. So that's what they did, and they, the art teacher turned them into posters, so they're really nicely done. Um, so for response inhibition, one of the ones they chose as a problem was choosing work over play. You know, it's a particular study a challenge. Um, kids get home, there's so many other fun things they'd rather be doing than doing their homework, so choosing work over play. And so these were some of the ideas they came up with. You know, alternate between work and play.
play, work for a while, then play, work for a while, then play. Um, turning off distractions, you know, things that are, are distracting. Build in rewards and breaks. Kids are amazing at being able to come up with their own idea for what's a reward you could give yourself after you've worked for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Uh, Self-talk, what could you say to yourself to get through that? Like, just do it. Uh, get it out of the way so you can do the fun stuff. I had, in one group, they, they mixed the kids up. So I had, in one group I had sixth graders and 10th graders, just for scheduling reasons. So they were all in the same group. So I had a whole group of sixth graders who, well, the first kid, he said, so I've discovered that if I do my homework early when I get home from school, then I have the whole rest of the evening to myself. I get to do what I want. <laughs> and a couple other sixth graders said, yeah, that's what they did too. At which point I looked to the Learning Center people who were sitting in the back of the room and I said, okay, how come these kids know to do this? They said, yeah, we've been talking about it. But they, they had the actual, once kids have that experience of what it feels like to be able to do their homework and then have free time afterwards. Um, you know, me personally, when I have that challenge, I, I tell my, because I work seven days a week, but I, on the weekends, I don't do that much work. And I think of once I've got my Saturday work done, I have a mini vacation. I get the rest of Saturday off until Sunday morning, and then it all starts all over again. But it just feels like, it really does feel like a mini vacation. You might be able to use that word with kids to help them recognize it. Um, this one, uh, emotional control. When homework is challenging or confusing, you get frustrated. That was one of the other items. Uh, walk away and come back. For some kids, that's really tough. They don't even think about it. Um, they don't think about walking away and coming back. Uh, they was, especially if they're on the autism spectrum or have problems with flexibility, if they hit a problem, they just want to keep on plowing through. That's a terrible idea because you've totally locked into a probably pretty rigid way of thinking about it. If you walk away and come back, if you can get kids to try that, you realize your mind refreshes afterwards. So if you can't, even just switching, okay, I'm stuck on math, I'm going to do my spelling now. Um, so getting them to switch that way. Uh, change your strategy, take an exercise break, again, self-talk. Um, and then I think the last one was, um, again, sustained attention, minimizing distractions and stay on task. Um, that, that was that one, uh, homework, there are so many distractions. Uh, and so they had, <laughs> these kids came up with great ideas. There was this one kid, um, he was an eighth grader, I think. Um, and what he said was, uh, his strategy. So I, I mean, my question was, if they were having trouble talking, I would come up with, I would say, well, what about, I mean, you guys all have cell phones, right? So doesn't that get in the way of doing homework? How do you handle that? And that would prompt kids to think about what they do. So this eighth grader was fairly short. In fact, that was part of the story. He said, okay, so here's what I do. I'm, I'm short, and everybody laughed. He said, so what I do is I do my homework in the kitchen. So I take one of the kitchen chairs, and I go over to the counter. I climb up on the kitchen chair. I open the top cupboard in my kitchen. I put my cell phone in that top cupboard drawer, and then I close the cupboard, and I get down, and I do my homework. So basically what he was saying is I make it so inconvenient for me to get my cell phone, that, that just makes it easier for me to stay on task. <laughs> you know, I thought about it afterwards. And I thought, if I had come in, I said, okay, here I am, the expert on executive skills. I'm going to give you some great ideas for how to do homework with manage distractions. And I had said to him, okay, so put your cell phone in the highest cupboard in your kitchen. That wouldn't have been half as effective as that kid himself, adorable kid. I'm sure he was a really popular kid, saying that's what he did. Um, I, I had another kid said, I make deals with myself. <laughs> you know, I tell myself if I get so much done, then I get to do this. So it was ba basically a first work, then play kind of thing. But I just love the way he said it. I make deals with myself. Um, yeah. Listen to instrumental music. A lot of kids do that when they're doing their homework. Um, they pretty and, and and that's what I found in general is listening to instrumental music uh, tends to be okay when you're doing homework. Uh, my 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 son with ADD told me at one point I can't listen to music with lyrics because then I start paying attention to the words, but I can listen to instrumental music. Th that's one of the very frequent questions I get from parents of kids that I see, you know, and they basically, you know, they'll say, so what do you think about my kid listening to his iPod while he's doing his homework? Uh, and the way they're telling me, they're asking me that question, it makes me realize they want me to say it's a bad idea and they want me to say in front of their kid that it's a bad idea so their kid will hear it from the expert. And unfortunately, I can't do that. Um, because what's, what's distracting to kids is not the music playing in the background, it's the unpredictable distraction. 
games. And that and music screens out un unpredictable distractions. Music screens out parents fighting in the kitchen or a kid watching, younger brother watching cartoons in the next room. Or same thing on tests. Um, you know, when kids are taking tests, a lot of teachers in my area allow kids to listen to music because it screens out bigger distractions and the unpredictable ones that really um, disrupt the work. Okay. So let me go through a few sort of general sort of thoughts and then we'll open it up for questions. I think we'll have time to do that. How can we work with kids to get them to use their own executive skills? Because that's our end, end game here, right? We can't keep giving them strategies and making them use strategies. We want them to generate strategies on their own. Uh, so one is uh, use minimal cues. Uh, if they need more support, model your thought process so they hear how you got to an answer. But rather than, and I think I came up with this list at one point where I was asked to do a, a workshop for Paris. Um, a school district asked me to work, because Paris are the ones often working one-on-one -on -one with these kids. And unfortunately, they're the least trained people in a school. And so they feel like their job is to make sure the kid does the work, make sure the work gets done. That's very different from making sure the kid does the work, right? So they end up providing more support, more cues um, for kids than they should. Um, they end up sometimes doing the work for kids. So they asked me to talk to parents about what they might be able to do differently. And so using minimal cues rather than immediately telling the kid what to do, seeing if there's anything in what they're being asked to do that they can just question them about that and that will move them to the next step. And I, off the top of my head, I can't think of a specific specific example, um, perhaps you can. Um, but the thinking aloud piece, um, that's a recommendation I often make to parents actually, and it would work with parents as well. You know, I have these parents who come in saying, you know, my kid falls apart over some homework assignments and doesn't have any trouble with others. And very, invariably when I ask them to give me examples, the ones they're falling apart over are the open-ended assignments. Uh, and the classic example of that is the spelling assignment where you have to to take every spelling word and put it in the sentence. <laughs> That's an open-ended task because there are an infinite number of sentences for every spelling word. And so very often it's a kid on the spectrum or an inflexible thinker that, that, whose mom I'm talking to. And the mom ends up saying, so my kid can't do it. So I end up feeding him the sentence. I say, you're right this. <laughs> uh, and they feel terrible about that. Uh, but they also know they can make the kids sit at the kitchen table till midnight and they wouldn't be able to come up with a sentence. So what I say to parents in those cases is, that's okay, you can feed them the sentence. But here's how I want you to do it. I want you to think out loud. So here's your thought process. And then parents don't know how to do that, so I model it. I say, okay, so let's say the spelling word were beautiful. I might say to myself, ah, I gotta come up with a sentence for beautiful. Where am I gonna start? Well, let me think about what it means. Okay, so it means pretty. Okay, so what are some things that are beautiful? Oh, roses are beautiful. Whoa, there's my sentence. And you can model different kinds of sentences and different ways of thinking about composing sentences. You can model what happens when you get stuck and you get end up at a dead end. How can you regroup and go at it from another angle? I mean, but that's the way I think, it, that's one way to help a kid in the early stages who's really struggling, particularly with open-ended tasks. Use visuals whenever possible. A cue on the desk you can point to or ask them to check their list. I am a huge believer in checklists. I, I, and if you look at Smart But Scattered or any, any of our other books, most of our intervention strategies have a visual associated with them, and many of them are checklists. You know, a checklist for the morning routine, again, a checklist for the end of the day routine, a bedroom cleaning checklist if it's a home-based one. If you can turn it into a checklist, then chances are you've thought it through pretty carefully. Um, and then just, rather than hounding the kid to do this and then this and then this, you say, just look at your checklist. So you're prompting them to review their checklist checklist, um, which over time the kid may realize, you know what, a checklist is a really useful long-term strategy. I'm going to use it for my own stuff um, because you've just prompted them to use it again and again. Praise effort, persistence, and risk-taking. I already talked about that. Um, ask children to reflect on their own performance, especially when they are successful. You know, for years, we've thought, and I remember as a school psychologist saying, you know, if, if the kid has a meltdown or whatever, you debrief afterwards. Talk about what happened. What could you do differently the next time? Do we ever talk to them about what went well? I mean, maybe people are doing it more, but I just remember as a school psychologist, which is a long time ago now, I never even thought about that. 
But when a kid actually is successful at something, what did you do to be successful? And in fact, that's a great whole class conversation. You know, this was a tough math problem today, and a bunch of you guys really uh, just buckled down and you figured it out. What were you doing to get through that? Because kids will listen to other kids. Um, so I think we should be doing way more of that. Um, why do you think it worked? Well, that's working on metacognition. Use questions to get them to use their executive skills. What's your plan? I mean, I love that question. I wish I'd had that when my kids were young. <laughs> I now have a, I have three grandchildren, and I remember it was probably around age two that I watched my daughter-in-law, who is actually a school psych professor at UNC Chapel Hill now, so she's got this background. But I could, I'd hear her watching, to, talking to Violet at age two. Violet really wanted to do something, they couldn't do it right now, and she would say, okay, let's make a plan. And we can't do it now, let's make a plan. <laughs> So at the age of four now, I bet Violet is amazing at making plans. That would be my guess. Um, or what's your goal? How long do you think that will take? Um, you know, I talked about time management being something that, that's, you know, these, we don't expect kids at this age to have time management. We can start with it, though. We can start by just timing how long it takes. I had a resource room teacher in one of my seminars. Now, admittedly, it was high school, but I think it would work at any level. When she's working with kids, every once in a while, she'll say to them, okay, you're working on that. I'm going to see how long it takes you. I'm just going to turn on the stopwatch and just periodically time them um, to give kids awareness because I think what happens we know the kids who underestimate how long something's going to take um, because they always leave it to the last minute and then they run out of time but there's a bunch of kids out there who overestimate how long something's going to take and then they put it off either because it's going to take for they think it's going to take forever or they think it's going to take longer than they want to spend so they're putting it off for that reason so in fact the first time I realized I had a mom who was, um, had a third grader. She said every night they fought about math homework. You know, these long knockdown drag out fights about math homework. Um, and she finally realized they were spending more time fighting about the homework than the kid was spending doing it. So she said to him, how long do you think this worksheet's going to take? And the kid said, it's going to take an hour. Well, that's a long time in the life of an eight-year-old. But the mom said, are you sure? Let's see if that's the case. They wrote down the time he started, the time he finished. They did the subtraction. It was 10 minutes. The kid was stunned. He had no idea he could do the homework that quick. Quickly. So if we can get kids just to time things, um, then it'll help the kids who have trouble dawdling and, and getting distracted, but it'll also help those kids who, who have no conception of time and therefore think it's going to take longer and put it off. Um, when problems arise, share your observation in a non-judgmental way. I noticed you had a little trouble uh, remembering to raise your hand during circle time. What do you think we can do about that? Um, so you, out, you lay out the problem and then try to problem solve with them. Brainstorm strategies. Together with the child, make a list of possible strategies. Ask the child to pick one and then check back. I'm, this is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, how you do this with individual kids. But it could be a whole class activity. And in fact, that one where they, they were using the visuals for not calling out during um, whole group class instruction, that's what it started with, the whole class. What are some things we could do? Um, and that's it. Okay. So, well, I will hang out here. If people want to come up and talk with me individually, I mean, that's fine. But we'll stop there for now. Thank you.